patience. Genesis chapter 15. Where we'll go today. Genesis chapter 15. It was first six verses. The title of today's message is Amen. So somebody asked me for a church. I, I don't remember how it came up, but they said, Are you looking for an Amen today? It's funny to be honest. Yes, I am looking for an Amen today. I want to continue on with life's questions. The last two times I've preached has been a a series of, of messages on that. We all have life's questions, don't we? We have those questions, the why and I question. Lord, why is this happening to me? Or I. Why do I suffer with this? And why do I have financial issues? And why do I have relational? And why do I have this going on and that going on? Why, 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 I, I, I? And, and if you remember in those last couple messages, I've encouraged you to step aside from that because a lot of times we're looking for that answer like right here, that one thing that we're looking for, but go back because that it might be something a little bit bigger than that and go way, way back, go back all the way to the beginning because in the beginning was who? God. And let's start looking at that and all that the Lord has done and all of these other questions we could be asking and perhaps find some of the questions, some of the answers that we're looking for, right? So challenged you to do that. We've talked about some things along the way there that evil has gotten in to mix up this plan. We've talked about prayer, that uh, prayer is this listening and talking with God and having a relationship and a fellowship with Him and sin, it distorts that and how Christ is the way back to that and all of these things we've discussed, right? And so I want to continue on today with amen. And so what I'd ask you to do if uh, I've asked you some questions all along, and if you believe what I ask you, then I'd like you to respond with the words, I believe. Now listen, I don't want you just to respond because you believe like up here, because you, you know it, you've read it, and, and you've been taught it. I want you to respond if it's here, through experience, you believe in your heart. So let me ask you, church, do you believe that this is God's word, and that it is truthful and that it is helpful to grow us and to teach us and to rebuke it, right? And, and that it's without error and it's God's very word spoken to us. Do you believe God's word? Do you believe in the one true God that this Bible speaks about, church? Do you believe that there's this great problem in our world and it's called sin and it separates us from this holy God, church? Do you believe that Jesus Christ came, lived, died, rose again to give life to those who would repent and believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through him? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the solution to that problem, church? Do you believe in prayer and the power of prayer? Well, then today we'll talk about do you believe, do you believe in all the promises of God? Genesis chapter 15. Now the last time we met, I was talking to you about this conversation that was going on in the garden, and I hadn't looked at it like this before. You know, prayer is defined as listening and talking to God in a right relationship with Him. It requires faith, and there in the garden, God's talking with Adam. And it just, I never thought of it as prayer because I often think of prayer as our hands are folded, our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed, and and I think of that as prayer, but it's conversation with this God. And it's taking place there in the garden. We've got another conversation taking place here in Genesis chapter 15. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue, or... In other words, I'll, I'll go to my death like this. For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, This man shall not be your heir, for your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look, towards heaven and number the stars and if you're able to number them and he said to him so shall your offspring be and he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness and now God's word has gone forth and it shall accomplish that for which he purposed 
on this day, for this place, for these people, and perhaps anyone that might hear this on the Internet, whether it be now or two years from now on, on, on the Internet here. Do you believe that to be true, church? Amen. I believe. Amen and I believe is what I just heard. Well, let's dive into this. Uh, this is actually one of the shorter messages, unless I get rambling here today. Um, and that may happen, just so you know. I love this story about Abram. I love it because it, it, it just shares so many different things. One of the things I like about it is that it is the story of this man who is rather elderly. And so in, in certain parts of the scripture, you hear he's way up there in age, and maybe around that 99, 100-year-old mark, right? And so do we have anybody here that's 100 years old? Anybody? Anybody? Were you just uh, stretching your shirt out, David, or were, were you 100? All right, just checking over there. So nobody's 100. So we're all south of 100 here, right? And so the encouraging thing here for me when I read this, because you all said that you believe this is God's word, and it's not just a bunch of nice stories that are made up. It's, it's truth, right? And so what we believe then is that God took this man who was rather old and started to do an amazing thing in him and through him in his life. And so every man, woman, and child here, it doesn't matter what your age is, listen, you can be used of the Lord in his service. You have a gift that you can do and use for the Lord, right? Amen. If you're here today and you're breathing, raise your hand. Okay, great, great. Then you can serve the Lord. If somebody next to you didn't raise their hand, give them a nudge, okay? We've got to make sure we're all right here in Family of Faith this morning. David, you're raising your hand again. All right, just checking. Fantastic. Good, good. That's one of the things I love about this passage is that he, he takes this rather old man and he just uses him. And then it starts to go and, and you, you start to look at this. And right now his name is Abram in this story. But if you were just to jump ahead a, a, a few quick chapters over, he gets called Abraham in verse 5 of chapter 17. God changes his name to Abraham and he's the father of many nations. Well, now this is a, a unique name change for me because the, the very thing we read is that he's crying out to God. He's asking God for a child. And I don't know how long he's been asking him. It could be years he's been asking him. It could be a matter of days. I believe it to be a lengthy time that he's been asking the Lord. Lord, give me this. And, 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 and he hasn't got it yet. I remember working with somebody uh, a few years back and and just sitting there, you, you see the wheels turning, and, and he got an idea, got an idea. And, and like two hours later, he's like, let's do this. And I'm like, how would you know this? I've been praying about it. Well, for him, two hours was enough time to pray. I don't know how long Abram's been praying about this. Maybe years. But he's crying out to God. He's asking God, God, this is the one thing I want. Lord, I want a child. I want somebody that's going to generation to generation and, and over and over again. What's the answer? Nothing. He gets nothing. He's even crying out to God. He's like, listen, I've asked and there's nothing. And God's going to change his name to the answer of that prayer. How would you like that to happen to you? And I know I've spoken this before, but it just keeps coming up in Scripture over and over again. The very thing he's asking for God, God changes his name to that. Except it isn't there just yet. And so every day when he walks around and, and, and somebody calls out his name, guess what he's reminded of? The one thing he doesn't have that he's been asking God for. How would you like that, family of faith? How would you like to be named the very thing you've been crying out to God for? Maybe it's finances, and, and every time someone calls your name, it's, it, it's a name related to finances or relationships or, or whatever the case may be, ministry. How would you like to be called something that the Lord hasn't yet provided? Well, don't you think that would sting a little bit? Don't you think that might hurt a little bit? So I don't know what's going on in this. For other than to know that there, there's probably some anguish here. God, I'm asking for this. And you just haven't provided it yet. And what I see in here is I st see that he starts to talk with God and he starts to tell God, listen, you see that guy over there, my servant, Eleazar? He's going to be my heir. That's the one. Because you haven't provided anybody. So now somebody in my house, that's going to be the one. 
And then if you were to flip forward to the chapter 16 there, what you're going to start to see is that Sarah goes to him and says, hey, listen, you see that servant girl over there. Why don't you just get with her? And then all of a sudden we'll have a child, right? And what does he do? And he's doing the very thing that sometimes we're guilty of, aren't we? He's manufacturing his own answers here. I'm asking God for something. We're singing a song about, Lord, let us be patient in these unanswered prayers. But we tend to do that, don't we? We want to go ahead and just answer and help God out. God needs help, doesn't he? Now listen, I don't want to squash anybody that's stepping out by faith and getting busy doing things for the Lord here. Because I believe that to be truth. You, you read in Scripture, I mean, when that, when that water parted, okay, there had to be a whole bunch of people right there. So they had to move forward first and get there, and then God parted that water. You read about a woman in Scripture who is, is broke, and, and they're coming to take her kids away, and she's got nothing but these, this jar and some oil, right? And God sends her off and says, you go get the jars. And then, and then the oil would fill up in these jars. There's a wedding, and they run out of wine. Go and get the water, and then bring it back. And he fills it into wine. There's loaves of bread and fish. Go get it. And then God feeds thousands with it. So there is this element of go and do, but then we've got to get to that point where we allow God to do as only God can do. Right? Is that an amen out there? Amen. We can't just step all over what God's about to do because what God may do could be a lot bigger and a lot different than what you and I asked for. And when we try to answer it for him, it probably doesn't go so well, does it, church? So he's asking God for this, and God takes him and, and brings him out and says, listen, what I want you to do is, is, Abraham, now I want you to look up towards heaven. Look up towards heaven, and I want you to look at those stars, and what I want you to do is to start to count the stars. One, two, Three, it's impossible. There's millions. He can't do it. And it's just a great reminder that God can do the impossible, can he? And when you're making plans with God, you, you got to make those large plans because it isn't always going to come in the form. God's, he's asking God for one child, and God's telling him, look, out there are all of those stars. That's how many are coming. They're coming. It's unbelievable. Never would Abraham have thought to ask for that, would he have? And so I go back to our why and our I questions and the very things we ask for and that we're looking for right here. And perhaps there's something out there that is bigger and different that the Lord has to work in us and through us and around us. We've got to be patient to wait for him. We've all been there with the why and the I questions and, and the anguish of why haven't you answered this, God? I've been asking over and over. There are people perhaps in this room that are just hurting because I've been asking God for this one thing and it hasn't been happening just yet. Why, God, why? I've been there. Oh, we're in a great season of life right now. I thank the Lord for it. And maybe we get labeled that, that, that oh, oh, the Martin's in that great season. But I can, I can tell you of times where, man, I was crying out to God. And I'm telling you, I'm crying out to God. It was hurting. And it was painful. And the very things I'm asking the Lord for, they're just not happening. And now I fast forward and look at this family. Never would have asked for it. The Lord is amazing. If you're here today and you're going through that season of the why and the I and God's just not answering, you don't hear it, might I encourage you to get outside tonight and look up towards heaven and start to count those stars and understand that our God is that big. He is so amazing and what he wants to do perhaps is much bigger than what you could even ask for. I love this part of the story because he takes him out and he starts to have him count the stars and he's trying to get, let, get him to figure out, oh, listen, they're coming. That many people are coming. And I believe, I believe that our God created this earth and, and he spoke it into existence. And before that, so there was nothing. There was just God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And he spoke it into existence, which means our God stood outside of space and time and created space and created time and acts in space and acts in time. But he is outside of it. He's not subject to it. And so he sees everything clearly and vividly 
in the present, right here, right now. He sees that creation week. He can see that. We can't. He can see that perfect, that perfect prayer conversation going on in the garden. He can see that right now. You and I can't. He sees evil slithering in and, and destroying that relationship. He sees a woman with the jars and the sea parting. He sees all of it. He sees the cross and he sees his son right there on the cross. He sees the day that you were born. He sees that life that he has given you, that span of life. He sees when you come to Christ and give your life to now a service for him and what you're doing with that life. He sees that final breath that you're going to take this side of heaven and that first breath that you'll breathe when you get to heaven. Wow! It's an amazing place. He sees that. And I wonder when he took Abram out and he said, count those stars. I wonder if he saw a family of faith that day. I wonder if he saw you. I wonder if he saw you. I wonder if he saw you that day. That's a wow moment for me. That's how great big our God is. And Abram realizes this. He goes from this place of doubt and, 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 and thinking that nothing's ever going to be answered. And he comes out and he says this, I believe! I love it. You keep believing, brother. I believe. And what's he doing there? It says that he says, I believed, and it was counted to him righteousness. Now listen, I want to take a detour off of this conversation, off of this prayer stuff, and I want to go over to salvation here. And I know some of you are like, oh, here he goes again. The whole salvation thing. You got it. It's that important. We're going to go through it. Because maybe today is the first day that somebody might hear that. It's that important. What else you got on your calendars or what I have on my calendars could be even more important than one person coming to Christ today. Anybody got something more important? No. Maybe somebody's been in here all of their life and they've heard it over and over again, but they've been blinded to it. Today, maybe their heart's open to it and they'll receive what the Lord has done for them. For the rest of us who know it and it's old news and, and well, here he goes again. I can recite it. That's the key. Have you recited it this week? Have you shared it with anybody this week? You see, in the beginning was God and he spoke existence. And there was heaven and there was earth and all that was in it. There was this perfect relationship with God, walking and talking and listening, faith, a right relationship with God, this kind of different kind of prayer than we know. And everything was fantastic, except for one of those created beings decides he wants to be God and he falls from grace. He falls from, right? And he slithers his way into that garden to bust that up. He, he's opposed to God. He's opposed to all that believe in this God and want to follow his ways. And he deceives man. And as a result of that, as a result, it brings disobedience to man. Death and destruction come into this world. And now this right relationship, this conversation, this, this faith, this, this is communion with God. It is broken. Right there in the garden. And it passes on from generation to generation to generation. But our God outside of space and time can look into space and time. He knows that's coming, so he's not caught off guard. So there's already a plan in place to save you and I. And it's this, that God the Father would send his son, Jesus Christ, to come here to put on flesh. And he'd be your representative and you'd be my representative. He'd be tempted and tried in all ways like you and I. Except we fail. Don't we, church? But Jesus would never fail once, would he? And he would take that life of righteousness and he would go to the cross. And there on the cross, he would pay the penalty that you and I should have paid for that sin. He would bear God's anger and wrath, like we read earlier in Scripture here, that you and I should have taken on God's anger and wrath. He would die the death that you and I should have died on a cross. But then he does something amazing he who laid down his life takes it up again three days later. He defeats sin. He defeats death. He defeats evil. And all those who would repent and say, listen, I know I'm born into this. Forgive me, God, for being separated here from you. I want a relationship back. I want to come back. to. If you would repent and ask the Lord for that and believe, not up here, right here, that Jesus Christ came and lived and died and rose again for you, Bible says you'd be saved right here, right now, in your seats. 
Amen. It's important to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Speaking of Abraham, not just in Genesis, we fast forward to Romans chapter 4. It says, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. And this is why faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in whom him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Believe. Abram believed. He believed in the promises to come. We look back at what God has already done on the cross. Do you see the relationship with Jesus Christ and how it is needed there? When Abram steps out and counts the stars, he says the words, I believe to God. And what he's saying there is he says, truly, truly, I believe it. All of my heart, I believe it, God. I agree with what, what you say here. What he's saying there in that word, believe, if you were to go back and look, the original word is where we get the word, amen. From. God tells him, count the stars, and he steps out, and it's not yet there, and he says, amen to that. Oh, church. In Scripture, in 2 Corinthians 1.20, it says, For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. That's Jesus Christ. That is why it is through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. It's through Christ. We need that relationship with Jesus Christ so we can have that prayer, so that we can believe in the promises, understand God's Word, and we can walk in it well before we even see it, like Abraham. Church, I want to challenge you today. I love challenging and pushing a little bit. This is a very quiet room. Probably it's a little warm in here, I would imagine, right? A little toasty. We like to get comfortable. Don't let your comfort get in the way of what God wants to do. So you come to church, and you hear a song, and it's got some truth. Church, you can say amen to that. And you can get loud and say amen, and it's okay. And, and listen, in prayer, we could say something that, that is truth, and we know it's true from the Lord. We can say amen, can't we, church? And we can open up God's word, and God's word, word may come out of my mouth and into your ears and deep down into your heart, and it speaks the truth to you. Brothers and sisters, there's no reason you can't yell out the words amen to that. Amen? Can I get an amen in this church? Amen. Fantastic. I'm going to give you all a chance to that. I'm going to end it just like I started it today. Church, do you believe? Do you believe? And if you do, instead of saying believe, say amen. Do you believe this to be God's word? Amen. Do you believe in the God that this Bible speaks about, our one true God? Amen. Do you believe there's a great problem in our world and it's called sin? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, that Jesus is the solution for this sin? Do you believe in power of prayer? And do you believe in the promises of our great God? Well, then listen, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. While I'm doing that, maybe Doug and the orchestra can come on up and get ready so we can sing a song. I'm going to give you another chance to sing that you believe this great God. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you've given us something to believe. Lord, if each one of us could say one thing, one promise in your word that we want to say an amen to, Lord, I pray that today we would do that, that we'd look up towards heaven and see how great you are and say amen to that promise. Lord, one great promise is your son. And the Lord, we're born sinners apart from you. But Lord, through him, we could have a relationship back with you. Lord, that is bigger than anything we could ever ask for. Lord, given to our own, our own will, Lord, if you asked us how we could save ourselves. Lord, we'd try to do something here. 
And it's not about doing, it's about believing and being a Christian. And so, Lord, I pray that if there's somebody here today that doesn't know Jesus, that they would understand what was done for them. And just like Abram, by faith, received what you've done. Lord, would they believe today with all of their hearts? And Lord, if we can believe in something so grand as a salvation, if we can put all of our hope and all of our trust into salvation and just how wildly different that is than what we can come up with, Lord, we can believe and count in those prayers that we've been asking. Lord, it's our hope here that uh, today you would reveal yourself through those prayers. And that, Lord, you would help us to be patient, help us to see what you're doing And that, Lord, the answer might look a bit different than what we asked for. But, Lord, we thank you for always hearing us, always loving us. And we thank you for your son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.